Hi, Steffi. How are you? Well, welcome Hello. to Nice Tuesdays. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you for having me. Not at all. No, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, so we're going to see some of your work in the background, just for everyone out in the audience. Um, that's going to kind of roll on behind us. But um, I guess I wanted to start by talking about your skills, because you were kind of, yeah, you're an autodidact. You taught yourself how to do 3D, right? Do you want to just talk us through a little bit how you, how you came to 3D and how you taught yourself how to do it? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go right back to the beginning. I did not expect to be a digital fashion artist. Did not know that could even be a thing, you know, when I graduated. So I actually studied graphic design. I studied at LCC. I thought I was going to be this awesome graphic designer in advertising and branding. Did not happen. Um, I ended up loving 3D motion design. So from graphic designer, I think I saw maybe a YouTube video. There is this designer called Grayscale Gorilla. If you guys are, who are motion designers here, you guys will definitely know who I'm talking about. He was one of the first to be posting tutorials about 3D motion design. And I was just like infatuated by what he did. And I was excited. So I decided that instead of just creating graphic design that was static, in publications, in editorials, or in posters. I wanted it to move. I found it way more exciting, and it's probably because when I grew up, I absolutely loved watching animation. I loved watching Disney, Ghibli, anything of the sort of that. I think it's the storytelling aspect that really talks to me. And so having graphic design move was just like, wow, it's exciting. So uh, that was my dream after I graduated. Of course, still within advertising and branding, that was where I thought I would be, actually, in post-production. But then COVID hit, I ended up being at home quite a lot. And I actually worked on a project that sparked my interest in digital fashion. Okay, interesting. You have to tell us about that project. What was that? So that, with this, before that, you didn't know what digital fashion was, and this kind of opened your eyes to that, did it? Yeah, no clue before. I think it was the year 2019, and I actually joined a collective because um, I, I think I just needed to be in a group that I could relate to, especially being a POC woman a designer in that case. There wasn't a lot of us there. So there was this collective called, uh, actually not was, they still exist. It's called DigiGirl. And I joined this group, and they are a collective full of LGBTQ plus women-led 3D artists or XR artists as well. And they were commissioned by Selfridges to create a collection that is physical, but make it digital. So of course it's digital fashion. Now at that point, I had no clue what it was, but they needed help with 3D motion designers for animation, for of course lighting, texturing, all of that business. So. I put myself forward. I think I was freshly graduated at that point. I had nothing to do. So this was just like the perfect, uh, I suppose, first project for me outside of uni. And so I went for that. And then I saw there were two digital fashion artists. They were working in Marvelous Designer or Clove 3D at that point. And they were, well, they were recreating these garments, these physical garments um, in, into, into digital. I just found it fascinating. I thought, oh, wow, this is so cool. And then it clicked because I realized what they were doing was, it was 3D. And I thought, well, I know how to do 3D. And I've always wanted to design my own clothes, just couldn't be asked to actually physically make it. So this is just the perfect time to make my dream clothes. Almost like, you know, have you guys played Sims? That's the best oh, yeah. part. Customizing yeah. your own clothes. I spend the longest time in that section. So this for me was the perfect thing to do. And at that point, it, I was just playing about. And then I just did it so much that now I do it every day. <laughs> That's a, a lovely story, yeah. I feel like the interior designers are in here going, that wasn't the best bit of Sims, no way. <laughs> um, I guess for those people in our audience who don't know, could you just maybe give us a little bit of a, an insight into how you think about digital fashion? Like, what is it? And right. um, what's a definition, I guess, from your side? Yes, we, we think we should have started with that, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, digital fashion, it is a new industry, so it's completely new. Um, it has been here for a while, especially if any of you guys are gamers. Um, if you guys know, uh, we talked about Sims just a moment ago, so anything to do with skins, customization of the clothes and that, that is digital fashion, essentially. So it's very closely timed to, to gaming. But digital fashion, in the most basic sense, is 
I suppose, representing clothes using pixels instead of fabrics. Mm -hmm. And I guess, like as I said in the introduction, there is a, an augmented reality version that's, I guess, for human bodies and then a, a more digital version, I guess, that's, that's fully on, yeah, in VR for avatars. Is that right? There's many ways you can wear digital fashion now, and I think it's going to set to grow in future. I think one of the ways you can wear it is with avatars in online games or in VR or in metaverses. You can customize your avatar and wear uh, your skins or your digital fashion pieces. The second way is wearing it using either your, a photograph and you kind of Photoshop it on. Mm -hmm. It's not that glamorous, but it can, it can be done. Or you can use augmented reality, which is similar to, of course, using face, feature, uh, face filters, yeah. but instead it's body tracking. And they use this body tracking so that you actually, as soon as you move, it will track your body and it's as if you're wearing this digital garment on top of you're, what you're wearing, so you're actually wearing two in one. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool. It's layering, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it's obviously, as you've said, it's like a very rapidly growing discipline. Um, when you give us, a, if you give us a bit of a like snapshot of what it's like today, what are you most excited about in the digital fashion world? Like, what's what's the stuff that you're seeing now that you're like, this is at the cutting edge of, of what's going on? Yeah, I think digital fashion is set to grow. That's for sure. Uh, a lot more, especially the younger generation, they just get digital, that they, of course, they, they grow up with digital and it's just second nature to them. So a lot more people are going to express themselves digitally. They're gonna have, of course, if you're gonna have a digital version of yourself, you're gonna wanna customize that. So digital fashion is gonna go along with that. And I think the more that people have access to certain technologies, whether it's augmented reality, or maybe we'll have glasses, I think there's a, a Apple's making some, I believe. Yeah, there yeah. might have been some news about that yesterday, I think. <laughs> yeah, and Snapchat's already got some out. They call it Snapchat Spectacles, where you, you put on some specs, and you can actually see augmented reality on top of whatever you're seeing. And the technology, yes, there's some limitations because it's the battery might uh, be, it won't last long enough currently. And I would say, as a 3D artist, in terms of the, uh, what you guys see here, these types of garments, they take a lot and lot of memory and, of course, polygons to make. When you convert that into game-ready assets like augmented reality and virtual reality, you have to compress the heck out of them. Right. And that almost makes the quality a lot less. And that's, as a designer, that makes me really, really sad. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for the technology to get better so that we can, of course, have the dynamics of when clothes move because clothes look great in movement. Yeah. They, they are very organic uh, materials. So uh, as soon as that happens, I'll be very happy. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Um, I mean, you've actually already kind of touched on this. I guess, like, I'd love to know how your process works, and I'm sure everyone in the, in the audience as well would love to know. Um, can you just talk us through, like, where does, uh, I guess, a, a garment or a collection, where does it begin? How do you kind of get from there to the finished design? What programs are you using? I think, yeah, let's get into the, the process of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I talk about this, it actually makes me cry inside because I use at least six programs to make all of this happen. And I wish it was easier, but I'm hoping AI will actually speed up the process. So um, you start with, I usually start off with a sketch actually to get the idea into my head and also to show it, if I'm working with clients, it's just to show it visually and very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we move on to actually choosing the avatar that you want to put the digital fashion garment onto. Uh, you use the program Daz 3D for that. It is free. It seems, that, it seems like every 3D artist knows about it because it's free and it's great, so I highly recommend it. Um, then we move on to actually making the garments. Now, there's many programs for this now. Um, the most popular ones are Marvelous Designer and Clo 3D. So you make your garments. Once you're done with that, I usually go into texturing. So, of course, you can use Photoshop. You can use, uh, I tend to use Substance Painter. And then the next part, oof, you, you add them all together, you put it into a 3D program of your choice. Um, my 3D program is Cinema 4D, just because I come from a motion design background. And lastly, you render it and you composite it, you make it pretty and you make it, you know, color correct it and all of that, you edit it uh, in After Effects and Photoshop. So it's, it's almost like a whole long pipeline. Yeah. And there's not an easy way to do it. 
I mean, I don't want to sound like a complete technophobe, but I'm going to focus on the sketchbook part of that, <laughs> that process. Um, just because I'm interested in where your inspiration comes from. I mean, we're obviously seeing so many of your, your creations behind us. Um, but yeah, where do, you get, where do you kind of come up with your ideas? Where, where does that inspiration come from? I think the reason why I'm so drawn to digital fashion is not only because I was so drawn to customizing in Sims. Mm. That was one, that's only one reason. But I think it was the best medium for me to express myself uh, as a, an artist or designer. So with digital fashion, I got to express my British Chinese identity, which I think is really important for me. Um, as I said, in, in the creative industry, there's still not enough POC designers. So I just really wanted to kind of like hold the torchlight and be like, I'm here, <laughs> I'm here. So um, I didn't find that feeling with 3D motion design nor graphic design, but I found it in digital fashion. And it's interesting because with fashion, fashion is all about expressing your character, your identity, your confidence. It's not always about what you wear, actually. It's about expressing, of course, how confident you are in yourself. So I feel like with digital fashion, that was one way of me actually, not only just expressing my British Chinese identity, but also a way for me to learn more about my Chinese heritage because I was brought up in London. So a lot of my, a lot of my learnings were very Eurocentric. And then I grew up as an adult and I thought, huh, I, I don't know much about Chinese history, Chinese culture. I mean, yeah, I eat the food, it's great. I love the food. But um, I, I kind of want to know more. So. This is a way for me to learn about my Chinese heritage, but also share it back to my audience as well. Uh, you mentioned your audience there, and you have this kind of amazingly engaged and loyal uh, community online, um, yeah, across your social media channels, but also you have a, a regular Twitch stream as well. Um, I'm just interested, why, why have you put so much emphasis on that side of things? I guess it is slightly more educational, it's slightly more community-minded. Yeah, what's, your, what's the reasoning behind that? Because you are also like, revealing your process as you go, I guess. Yeah, so the reason why I'm so passionate about sharing my process is because everything I learned is self-taught. Everything I learned is from the school of YouTube. So thank you, YouTube. <laughs> no, truly, it's yeah, yeah. Um, everything I learned that is, that, that is technical to my career, I learned through um, the people who put out free tutorials on YouTube, and I thank them wholly. So that is why I'm doing the same thing. Um, and also because I've noticed there is a gap in the digital fashion, I suppose, designer market. Mm -hmm. You either got 3D artists and you either got fashion designers, but none that have the understanding of both. Mm -hmm. So I come from a 3D background. I actually don't have a fashion background, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually finding that I'm learning currently still fashion terms and you know even just fashion history. So, of course, there's going to be fashion designers who want to get into this, but they don't have the 3D skills. So, what I'm trying to do right now, um, as I suppose one of, one of the few digital fashion artists in the space, is actually just showing the process and helping people understand what goes into it. I mean, if anyone wanted to you know, set up their own community online, what have you found are some of the most successful tips, I guess, for, for building a community? Because you've done it yeah, so kind of organically and so successfully. Um, what have you found has really landed with your, with your audience? What are they kind of actually hungry for? And, and what are they, I guess, by, by extension, what are they less interested in? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think running a community is hard. That's what I've learned, that's right. for sure. But you need to, you need to turn up. You need to, co you need to have a place to meet every single week. And I think that's where my Twitch streams really help because with live streams, you can see the process straight away, but you can also see my face. And I can also answer your questions straight away. So you're already building that relationship there. Now, I know not everyone's comfortable with live streaming. So if you're not comfortable with that, I wholly recommend maybe going onto places like uh, Discord, uh, where you can have instant messaging there, and you can share your process there. I find Twitter is also a good space to, to find the art community as well. Instagram, I don't really have luck finding, or, or I didn't find it as easy mm -hmm. finding new designers there, right. just because of their algorithm. But Twitter, Discord, and Twitch, I found it a lot easier. That's interesting. I, do, I wouldn't have thought Twitter is, is better than Instagram there, but yeah, very interesting. Um, I guess digital fashion is also intrinsically connected to, to Web3 and, and to NFTs. Um, again, not kind of assuming anyone here necessarily knows those terms that well. Um, first off, yeah, what do we mean by Web3? I mean, I, I guess, yeah, probably everyone's heard of it, but maybe doesn't know what it refers to. 
Yeah, so Web3 is almost like the new generation of the World Wide Web. It includes decentralization, it, inclu it includes, I suppose, the blockchain, mm -hmm. and it includes token-based systems. Now, these might sound like huge terms, but I'm gonna try and break it down as simply as I can. Um, the way that I use Web3, I suppose, is you have a digital asset, which is your NFT token. You upload this digital asset, it can be artwork, it can be audio, it can be an AR filter, anything digital. So you upload that onto the blockchain, and then someone who likes it for any reason, it, they can collect it, they can buy it. They purchase it in exchange for cryptocurrency, and that is now owned by them. And it's as simple as that. So the reason why I use it is because I suppose digital fashion, it is really closely connected to Web3. And I really like the transparency because every single transaction, the transaction that I just mentioned, everything is documented on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So you can see, it's almost like a receipt on the blockchain. And you can't change it. You can just see where it's gone, who it's gone to, who owns it. And that is something you don't really see in Web2. And that's what, I think that's why a lot of people are drawn to it because they like the transparency, they like the authenticity of it, and they can see where everything's going. Yeah. I mean, I guess NFTs, you've obviously mentioned that, that the kind of tokens and, and that market. I guess when, particularly when NFTs were everywhere, probably 2020, 2021, maybe last year as well, um, you know, they really hit the public consciousness then. And it felt like there was a lot of backlash, I think partly around sustainability as well, which has kind of became quite a big talking point. Are there things about NFTs that, that worry you? Would you feel like actually there is maybe a bit of misinformation out there about how bad they are or how good they are? Mm, that's a good one. Um, when I first joined this NFT rage, I suppose it was, yeah, 2020 probably. The reason why I joined, it was just a way for me to actually sell my artwork and digitally in exchange for cryptocurrency. It was a new way of income. I didn't have to rely on clients. Um, so at this point, um, currently I'm still a freelancer, but you know, for, as a freelancer, I was just solely reliant on client work. And if I didn't get client work, Oh God, yeah. what am I gonna do next month? So this was just a new way of earning income. So it was very exciting for a lot of the digital artists back then. Yeah. What we didn't know, of course, was the energy consumption. That was, of course, noted in, I think it was in this article that completely blew up on Twitter or on the internet. Yeah. And everyone thought, oh my God, NFTs, they are ruining the environment. And rightly so, right? They were, you know, they had facts and they had the data to back that up. As I said, on the blockchain, everything is transparent. You can see it on the internet. There's no lying. There's no covering it up. Now, it's been about, it's been three years. Oh my God, it's been three years. So <laughs> yeah. within, I think last year, um, the blockchain that everyone was quite concerned about, which was Ethereum, which is the second most used blockchain, it's quite popular. Mm -hmm. Within two years, they have managed to change from, they used to use proof of work system, and now they changed to proof of stake. Now what that means is that they cut their energy emissions by 99.95%, which- It's quite a lot, yeah. It's a lot, <laughs> and I'm like, good. I mean, have you ever heard of another industry that has switched that quick within two years? Now the reason why, I get this comment all the time on my TikTok or whatever, like online saying, oh, NFTs are the worst, they're so bad. But, I, you know, times have changed. They have made improvements. I think they took the feedback on. And people are still referencing an article that happened, what, two, two three years ago. Yeah. So the thing that really irks me is that because with Web3, everything is transparent, you can see it online, uh, people will attack that. But people don't think about all their other digital assets that they use or programs. So whether it's email or social media, where they store this, you know, information on servers, where do you store, if you've got photos for the cloud, videos for the cloud, all of these digital things are stored in servers somewhere in the world, right? They're gonna be using energy somewhere. But is that information being shared out freely to everyone? So I find it quite interesting because, with, of course, they're private, com private companies, right? So these types of information aren't freely shared, which is why when something is completely transparent, people are in uproar. So um, I hope that has debunked a lot of 
what people think is uh, the worst thing in the world. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that transparency is kind of its biggest, I guess, like positive and its biggest challenge as well is that, yeah, people have ammunition if they want to find something. There's always, it's fully transparent, as you say. Um, I'd like to focus on, on just, just one project, actually, now. Um, you carried out this project while you were in Paris, I think, earlier this year, when you were talking uh, at an NFT festival there. Um, can you just talk us through that project and what it entailed? Because it was kind of, it's an interesting example of what we were talking about earlier, the kind of AR versus VR side. Yeah, so I was invited to go to NFT Paris to do a talk for digital fashion. And it, in terms of NFTs, digital fashion is, like, minuscule. It's uh, in comparison to everything else that's happening in the NFT world. So I really wanted to go to Paris and just showcase what digital fashion is all about and also just introduce people to what digital fashion is. So I was running around Paris and I actually printed out 100 envelopes because I, I physically gave it out to people. Inside these envelopes were QR codes to um, NFT artworks that I created of digital fashion pieces. And so with each envelope I gave out, people would be receiving a free NFT to mint. On top of that, they could also try this NFT token, this digital fashion piece, as an AR filter. And that, for me, was the best part, actually. Getting people involved using an AR filter, and I actually partnered with a company called Zero10, and they have the best body tracking for AR, or digital fashion pieces, at the current moment. So I think once people tried it, they were fascinated, they loved it. But when you just see it as an artwork, they didn't really get it because with digital fashion, it has the word fashion in it. And people want to wear fashion, right? <laughs> so I think um, going forward, what I've learned from the, that experience is that, um, you know, AR or VR or having the experience to wear digital fashion is really going to help push this industry forward. And so for me, that little experiment, because it was really, uh, it was one just to introduce people to digital fashion, but also a way to market myself to people who had no clue about what digital fashion was. I guess, I mean, you touched on there the kind of the future. I'd like to look at the future of digital fashion now. Um, you mentioned that it's in a very exciting space right now. There's lots of interesting things happening. I guess when you look to the future, where do you see this field moving in the coming years? And I guess by extension then, where do you see your own work moving in the coming years? Because, yeah, you're hopefully going to stay as a digital fashion artist. But, um, yeah, I'd love to hear where you think this is going to go next. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> I feel like in five years' time, there's going to be so many things that I'm going to say now that probably will happen in a year's time, just because technology is adva advancing so quick. I definitely believe in augmented reality. The fact that we use face filters without even thinking now, I think digital fashion is going to be that easy in the future as well, where you just swipe and then you can wear your whatever digital fashion piece that you want. So that's the first thing. I also think that a lot more of you guys in the future will be using uh, digital fashion on your cameras, but also, like I said, with Apple's new spectacles or even Snapchat's new spectacles, a lot more people are going to be using AR fashion or AR in that way as well because it will become more accessible. And in terms of educating, actually, I hope the industry will... Well, actually, the universities mm -hmm. and actually uh, just companies in general will actually pick up digital fashion. I think there's one or two universities now that just solely have a digital fashion course. Wow. Yeah, nice. I think one of them is Ravensbourne, okay. and the other one is in UCA. I, might, I need to check that second right. one, though. <laughs> but it's, it's a good sign. Yeah. It's a good sign. So um, what's really great about digital fashion, of course, people think, of course, what's the point? Sustainability-wise, it's going to be a lot better for the fashion industry is, I think it's one of the most polluting industries in the, in the world, right? Yeah. So for digital fashion, it's going to counter that and, of course, change the way that we interact with fashion. Yeah. I think it is the second, after the automotive industry, I think fashion is the second biggest polluter. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's right. Um, we've got a bit of time now for questions from the audience. So we obviously had quite a lot submitted by, by our audience. It's fantastic. Um, I'm going to just go through them, if that's all right. So Dan and Jay is the first one. How do you connect with the digital fashion community? The digital fashion community is tiny. I can really count them on the palm of my hand. <laughs> so that means there's definitely more space for more designers to come in and also just you know, create their own digital fashion brands. There's definitely space for that. 
And uh, the way you connect with them, well, it's, as I said, on Twitter, actually, that's where all the web-free NFT people hang out, I would say, and on Discord as well. So that's where you would find everyone. That's where you've got to go, Dan and Jay. Um, Kat asks, what's the best software to try on AR fashion? I think AR specifically. Um, you're talking about the programs or the actual apps I think that it means, use? yeah, I think Kat means programs. I'm, I'm sorry if I've mistaken that, but I, I think, I could talk yeah. about both, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, if you're thinking of making uh, AR fashion, you've got, of course, um, Lens Studio, that's um, owned by Snapchat. Mm. You've got, of course, Spark AR. You have also, oh, there's one more. Zero Ten are also, they've got their own one as well. So those are programs you can mess about with. I believe Unity, if you guys, any of you guys are into Unity, you guys can make your own assets, turn them into filters with that. And uh, in terms of apps, you've got, of course, Snapchat is still one of the pioneering for augmented reality, of course, and uh, DressX, Zero Ten, and of course, you've, we've got Meta, can't forget about Facebook, yeah. Them as well. Yeah. That's for trying on clothes in, in, I guess, like in AR, is that right? I think Meta has a little bit more to go, but definitely Snapchat, right. definitely DressX, definitely Zero Ten. Okay, perfect. Um, Stephanie asks, do you have any advice for someone struggling to develop their 3D skills whilst working a full-time job? Um, which I imagine is, yes, the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, 3D is hard. Just because there's so many things that go into it, you're talking about, of course, you know, modeling, lighting, animating, texturing. I think there's way more to that. So I think the best way to approach it, just because it's such a huge topic, is probably setting yourself a goal to make a little project every single week. And you need a, a counter buddy. Accountability buddy? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Someone's mentioned that to me before. You need someone who's going to tell you, have you done it yet? <laughs> have you done it this week? So um, I think, you know, setting yourself a little project of what you want to do, whether that's in Blender, Cinema 4D, and then actually, or you could either follow a tutorial that would take you through something. That's also really helpful. I just would caution following tutorials to the T just because it doesn't involve you creating or using your creativity too much. You're just actually copying. So if you're going to use a tutorial, just actually take it and then turn it into your own. I'm going to ask another one from Dan and Jay, actually, because this one's great. Uh, have you ever thought about making your digital clothes physical? I know you mentioned at the beginning that you wanted to be a fashion designer, but <laughs> didn't want to make them in physical form. Is that something you're interested in doing or anything like that? Yeah, physical fashion kind of scares me because I've never made it before. But it is something I'm willing to learn. And actually, I just want to mention this hoodie that I'm yeah, wearing yeah. right now, just because it is by a brand called Artifact, which is a digital fashion company and are owned by Nike now. But uh, this hoodie, I bought it using an NFT token. And this NFT token, only if you own this NFT token, you can redeem this physically. Now, it did take a few months to come. That's another thing. That's another <laughs> issue. I wish it, you know, we're so used to the next day delivery from Amazon and all that. So that's something, of course, uh, these companies need to work on. But, what they are using is what they call a made-to-order system. So you, of course, you purchase an NFT token. Then they know how many they got to make. Mm -hmm. They're going to make it. Then they send it to you, which is why it takes longer. But there's one key thing I want to show you guys. I wonder if I could show you. Um, if you guys can see this patch here, it is an NFC tag. So what this allows this garment to do is to connect the physical piece to your NFT token. And it's a good way of verifying things to make sure that they're legitimate. So I know there's a huge issue in the fashion industry where things are fake. But with this, I own the token. Nobody else can own it. This is connected to my NFT token, which maybe in the future, since I own this token, I might get certain perks to go to events or maybe redeem another physical piece. So it, the possibilities with NFT technology is really endless. And that's where I see digital fashion going. Um, will I make physical pieces in the future? Maybe. I think I need to do a bit more research into what actually goes into the production and manufacturing. But um, yeah, it's definitely an exciting time. And I do see a lot more brands using this type of system. Mm -hmm. um, 
Fine. Thanks so much for everyone who, who submitted a question there. They're really wonderful. Um, finally, I guess a last question from, from me, some, some career advice maybe for our audience. Um, you've mentioned in the past that you're a, an opportunist, I think is how you described it, an opportunist when it comes to your career. Um, can you just explain, I guess, what you mean by that and uh, yeah, how, how you feel that's helped you being an opportunist? I guess I'm always very curious and I like to learn. I think that's a key part. I do like to learn. Um, it's the whole reason why I'm very self-taught in many, many things, um, especially for my career. If I didn't bother learning 3D, I wouldn't be here. If I didn't bother learning digital fashion, I wouldn't be here. I think it's because I was curious and I had nothing else to do that I found pleasure in learning. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> now it sounds weird I'm saying it to myself, but I think as a creative, because sometimes when we start working in jobs, it get, you turn into a robot and then your creative soul dies. So I feel like if that's happening to you guys, maybe spend an hour um, really doing something a bit different, doing something that you want to do, because I would not be a digital fashion artist if I didn't push myself to learn. And be, I've failed so many times. If you guys looked at my first iterations of my digital fashion pieces, they did not look like this. Okay, so they were really bad at first, but I got better, of course, with practice. So I think staying curious is the key. And if you guys want to become something, you've got to just put a little bit of effort into making it happen. Yeah. That's a great, a great uh, note to end on. I'm afraid we have run out of time there. But Steffi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.